1932, Washington was under siege. The capital was surrounded by over 10,000 unemployed veterans of World War I from all over the country. Their only assets were the bonus certificates they'd been given after the war, which promised a cash bonus sometime in the future. They needed it now. At the end of May 1932, nearly 10,000 bonus marchers occupied the nation's capital. And tens of thousands more were on their way. I'm going to get my bonus, and I'm going to wait for till I get it if I have to wait till 1945. What's it that brought you to Washington? Why, well, to beat the undertaker, spend the money before the undertaker gets it. I know who's made this country worth living in. It's just you fellas. Look. Makes me so damn mad a whole lot of people speak of you as tramps. By God, they didn't speak of you as tramps in 1917 and 18. No. <laughs> Take it from me. This is the greatest demonstration of Americanism we've ever had. Pure Americanism. President Hoover was left to deal with the veterans when the Senate rejected their demands. The marchers had stayed, camped out in central Washington. On July 16th, the last day Congress was in session, Washington was on edge. Thousands of angry veterans surrounded the Capitol. Near midnight, the 72nd Congress adjourned. Congressmen left through back doors and underground tunnels to avoid confrontations. The situation had come to a head. The president ordered the evacuation of the veterans from downtown Washington. Now you bring in the troops. When MacArthur moved his troops to the affected area, he knew exactly what he was going to do. And he adorned himself in his dress uniform along with his major aide, Dwight D. Eisenhower. The force stepped off at 4.30 p.m. More than 200 cavalrymen spread out across Constitution and Pennsylvania Avenues. Behind them came 400 infantrymen, followed up by tanks and armored vehicles. The cavalrymen, one of whom is Major Patton, have got their sabers out. The soldiers donned gas masks and without warning began hurling gas grenades at the veterans. The troops advanced, some jabbing with bayonets. It's war, the greatest concentration of fighting troops in Washington since 1865. I knew something was going to happen, that they might be attacked. And uh, I had a press card, so I passed the police lines and then I saw the soldiers advancing into the camp and when confronted with this the men all stood there and said stand firm as long as you can and uh, they started throwing tear gas the tear gas was just burning my face i was trailing behind my dad and he kept hollering come on boy come on boy marchers were choking from the gas just like the battlefields in France. And so they're being forced out of their shacks by smoke bombs and tear gas hurled by the troops who have been called out by the President of the United States. I'd never seen anything like it. They systematically went down the line, burned up all the tents and all the possessions of the people there. I was thinking of Herbert Hoover when this happened, because his election was in three months. I thought this would be, uh, would be the finish of Hoover. The orders of the president must be obeyed. And the roaring flames sound the death knell to the fantastic bonus army. In the shadow of the beautiful dome of the capital of the United States of America. The veterans did not believe the country for which they had fought would ignore the plight into which the depression had placed them. Many did not believe that United States troops would take the field against them. By early evening, most of the marchers had been driven across a drawbridge that led to their main camp. The president does not want MacArthur to cross the bridge. And MacArthur disregards the order. 
Eisenhower later says that he saw this happen. MacArthur says, I cannot bother with pieces of paper doing a military operation. And so he crosses the bridge. All through the camp were scenes of panic. My dad says, let's get the hell out of here. The soldiers are going to kill us. Then troops began to set fire to their wooden shacks. One reporter wrote, the blaze was so big it lit the whole sky. A nightmare come to life. The president looked out a window of the White House in the direction of the fire, then retired for the night. And the roaring flames sound the death knell to the fantastic bonus army that ends so disastrously in the shadow of the capital of the United States of America. The morning after the bonus route, public sentiment took a dramatic turn against Herbert Hoover. If the expulsion needed a human face, it came in the person of Joe Angelo, whose story was published across the nation. Joe Angelo gets the Distinguished Service Cross for saving Patton's life on the battlefield. The next morning, Angelo comes to the uh, burnt out field to see Patton. And Patton says, take this man away, I don't want to see this man. The BEF was broken up. The men returned to some city or other, there to roam the streets, hopelessly seeking work or to shuffle in bread lines. There they remain, crying examples not of the need for the bonus, but of the need for a new American system.